Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another class of English 372 Sociolinguistics. I'm back. I'm back in the recording studio today. It's been a little while off since the spring since I've done this, so if I'm a little rusty, you'll forgive me. Uh, but we've got a fun one today, and I hope you learn a lot. I hope you enjoyed the last lecture as well that was on um, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, linguistic relativity. We're going to be talking a lot about that in our in-sync, or our in-synchronous, our in-person, not in-person, whew, rough, rough start to a video here, our um, live virtual class on Monday, where we'll have a chance to discuss some of the things that you saw in the video on linguistic relativity, and we'll bring up some more topics and continue talking about that because it's, it's a quite interesting topic. So I hope you found that one good. Today we're going to let that lead us into a related topic, which is linguistic anthropology. And we're going to spend at least two lectures here talking about linguistic anthropology. Today what I want to do is um, tell you what linguistic anthropology is. That's a good place to start. And we're going to talk from a more abstract level. What is linguistic anthropology and how is it different from sociolinguistics? These are two different fields, two different sub-disciplines um, in academics. So we're going to talk about some of the similarities, a lot of the similarities, and some of the differences between these two disciplines. We'll lead on, we'll, we'll finish up probably talking about um, language documentation and fieldwork, which is a big part of linguistic anthropology. Um, That'll be today. So it's a, an abstract, more getting our feet wet into what these things are. And then probably we might talk about it some in class on Monday, depending on how into linguistic relativity you guys are and how much we chat about that. Otherwise, certainly we'll get to it at least by Wednesday. We're going to take a more in-depth look at a particular linguistic anthropological study. This is the study... Um, Wisdom Sits in Places by Keith Basso. Like I said in class the other day, this is one of my all-time favorite readings. Not just for this class, just period. Um, so I really hope you read it. Uh, make that one a priority to have read, preferably by Monday, or at least start it by Monday, so that if we get to that in the discussion, you'll know what we're talking about. And definitely by Wednesday. Um, cool. So let's dive into it. Let's take a look. Oh, i got to get my technology straightened out here. There we go. I can't do presentation mode, by the way, because then it messes with my dual screens that I have going. Also, side note, if I look to the side, it's because I'm looking at the other screen, making sure everything's actually recording so I don't lose this. Um, cool. First question is, what is linguistic anthropology? And there's some kind of dumb answers here. So linguistic anthropology is a branch of anthropology. That's the basis, the starting point for this talk. The, and um, it's the particular branch of anthropology that studies the role of language with regards to both people, individuals, and communities. So it's a language-focused branch of anthropology. Um, and it explores a lot of different things, and it explores a lot of things that we've already been talking about this semester, right? How the role that language plays in social identity and group membership, right? We talked about that through indexicality. That term indexicality, which we've been relying on a ton in sociolinguistics, our sociolinguistic class, is actually a term from linguistic anthropology. That's a Michael Silverstein, a famous linguistic anthropologist at the University of Chicago. That's his term. So we're borrowing from a lot of these things that linguistic anthropology was already doing. And we'll see that being a common theme throughout today's lecture. Cool. But there's some differences too, right? How is this? This sounds a lot like what we've been doing. Language's role in social identity and group membership and ideologies, all these things that we've been discussing. So how is this different from what we've seen so far in sociolinguistics? If both disciplines are interested, essentially what I want to posit to you is that both disciplines sit at this intersection between language and people. It's where language meets people and where the, the perspective that what we can glean from the actual language, sociolinguistics versus linguistic anthropology and their respective disciplines where linguistics, is, sociolinguistics is a subdiscipline of linguistics and linguistic anthropology is a subdiscipline of anthropology is their starting boundaries, right? Where 
sociolinguistics comes from a linguistic tradition and adds tax the socio on, adds the people onto it. Linguistic anthropology is the opposite. It comes from this people-centric anthropology and it tax the language on. I'll get more specific about that, but if they're both at this intersection, how are they different and is that difference meaningful? What gives here? I already talked about this. Skip that. Cool. And we're going to look at a couple ways that these disciplines differentiate themselves. But I want to say, starting out, that there is a ton of overlap. A ton of overlap. So you would be forgiven. There's enough overlap that it has been claimed that these things aren't so different, in fact. So you're forgiven for that. We're going to talk then about the tendencies, not necessarily in abstract definitions of these two disciplines, but in tendencies. How do they differ? How do they differ in a few different ways? One more caveat, one more caveat. Um, these fields are changing over time as well. So I'm going to get a bit of a historical trajectory later on, but know that it's hard to say how these things are similar and different when they're constantly in flux. Sociolinguistics in particular uh, well, at least that's the one I know more about, is changing constantly. We'll talk about that at the end. So all of this with the grain of salt, the things I'm about to say. This is extending the point that I made earlier, that the difference, there's a difference in focus, not necessarily a, a difference in subject matter per se, but a difference in the focal point. What do we focus on within this intersection of people and language? And anthropology tends to, linguistic anthropology here, tends to have a more holistic focus. And that's part of anthropology as well. It borrows that from things like cultural anthropology and the field as a whole. A holistic focus on these cultural human systems and the role that language plays in these cultural systems. How does language affect them? See, it sees language as one of a number of meaningful cultural systems that all participate in this identity and membership and meaning constructing um, patterns that we find. So it's, it's looking a little bigger picture at how language and linguistics and language use plugs into this bigger picture. So we see this show up in some studies. I tried to give some examples instead of just being ultra definitional. Um, so hopefully this, you can see what I'm talking about here. The example I give here is that a linguistic anthropology study might focus on something like um, ritual greetings and what these ritual greetings have to say about the worldview of a community. Right? They always greet their so them each other um, talking about the winds, perhaps. And so this it's part of that ritualized greeting and that shows something about the importance of winds and weather in the worldview of a community. I am 100% making that up, that's not a real example, but it's the right idea, right? How that language plugs into these larger order things. Another example that I like a lot, this one, there have been studies about this, is on how language is used to socialize children. So it's looking at these cultural systems and constructs overall, how these people are, their culture, and how language plays a part in imparting that culture to the children. Again, how language is part of this larger system. And how do we study that? Well, we don't talk about past tense suffixes, probably, when we're talking about that. We're talking about language use on a little bit of a different level as well. We're not focusing on maybe a morpheme by morpheme rendering of the language and how that has to do. We're talking about linguistic practices, the linguistic practice of greetings or the linguistic practice of speaking to children and how that plugs in. We can, now, I, I don't want to shortchange linguistic anthropologists, they can certainly get down in the nitty gritty and do a morpheme by morpheme if they want, but the focus is a little bit different. Hopefully this will become more clear as we look at some examples as well. In opposition to this, not true opposition, but as the counterpart to this, linguistics and sociolinguistics tend to focus on, shocker of all shockers, language. 
It's more linguistic centric. It's more looking at specific language uses, not necessarily language as a practice and its role that it plays larger, but this particular phoneme, this particular morpheme, this particular structure or sentence type, more stemming out of drawing from its neighboring subdisciplines, right? Sociolinguistics, a subdiscipline of linguistics, it draws a little more heavily from things like phonology, morphology, and syntax. Semantics too, I suppose. Um, and here is an example, right? We um, have talked at various points about a Campbell Kibler um, study, which looks at the difference between the full ing ing and in, like going versus go in. These that specific ending does it have that going or does it have go in and what that means? It's still related to social meaning and possibly community meaning meaning, but it's not as big pictured still. It's still more narrow at the language. Okay, so that's difference number one that we just covered. A different focus between these two. The second difference that we're going to look at is a difference in methodology. And I think this one's where we start to see more, it, it helps elaborate more of the differences between these, maybe even more helpful than the focus itself. Anthropology methodologically, and when I say anthropology here, I mean kind of anthropology as a whole, this is true of, but think of it more particularly as linguistic anthropology. Linguistic anthropology relies traditionally more on fieldwork. Fieldwork and ethnographies. And these fieldwork and ethnography projects that take a long time. It's kind of a stereotype, but yeah, you know, sometimes there's truth in those things. That they're in places for the long haul. They often spend years on site doing field work, talking to people and conducting observational ethnographies for the projects that they do. This difference in methodology, this preference in methodology, tends to result in a little bit more qualitative studies as well. There's a favoring of qualitative studies over quantitative. And it's a favoring, it's not hard. They certainly can engage in quantitative studies as well. Um, but they're getting the feel, the lay of the land there, using their hard-won wisdom of fieldwork over an extended period of time to be able to say something qualitative about what's going on. Similar, I hope you can see how these all kind of line up. This tends to favor emic interpretations of meaning. So one of the reasons they spend long periods of time on site is to get an understanding of how people think about their language use and the meaning that the group itself ascribes to certain linguistic usages. That's emic, right? Emic is an insider viewpoint that's contrasted with eic, which is a researcher viewpoint. So linguistic anthropology, with its longer time and emphasis on fieldwork, gets heavier access to emic interpretations, which take a long time to develop. Why do emic interpretations take longer to develop? I want to spend just a second talking about this. There's two reasons, there's two ways in which emic interpretations take longer. One is that if a researcher wants to get themselves into the rhythm of the people that they're working with, into that mindset themselves, so that they can better understand it through a process called participant observation. So not just fly on the wall observation when anthropologists are doing field work, but they're participating in the communities that they're studying. And this participant observation over long extended periods of time helps them to understand themselves emic interpretations. That's one. Now you could make an argument here. If I was Deadville's advocate, I would say, yes, but they're never going to understand the community and the layers of meaning, the emic layers of meaning there, as well as the people who are native to the community. And that's true. That's absolutely true. You can, it helps, that doesn't downplay that. It still helps to get closer to the mindset and the worldview of the people you're studying in order to understand it, but you'll never get all the way there. 
So why don't we just ask the people? And that might negate the length of time that these studies have to be conducted. Well, the idea here is that you need people to trust you in order to get at what's actually going on there. A lot of these things, either people aren't willing to tell you if they don't know you, they'll just tell you to go away now. Um, why do they, they don't owe you anything, maybe you pay them, but that doesn't get their allegiance, that just gets their participations. Um, so it helps when people trust you to actually take the time to tell you these emic interpretations. That's one. <laughs> And the other one is that these take a long time to tell. Sometimes these emic interpretations can't be into simple, be put into simple words, like there's a sentence that's just going to tell a linguist what's going on here. You need more time with the person to allow them to tell you that, either through trust or just through difficulty of communication in these types of subtleties. Yeah, so that's a difference in methodology that I hope you see. And uh, it's not really a difference, that's just a statement of methodology. The difference will become more clear when we look at, oh, 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 there we go. When we look at sociolinguistics in contrast. Sociolinguistics in contrast relies more traditionally on surveys and smaller scale observations. So sociolinguistics has always done some amount of observations, but they're generally not for as extended periods of time. Generally, this isn't sociolinguistics, at least traditionally, living within communities, but going to places and doing some observations, whatever. And so this reliance on surveys, and kind of, to put it not so gracefully, often quick and dirty observations, tends to lead them into quantitative studies, quantitative analyses over qualitative. Surveys are very easily quantifiable. X percentage of people used this form when filling out how to say this sentence. X percentage of people um, answered the survey in this way, saying that they're in favor of this or against that or whatever, or they think this about it, right? You can quantify surveys nicely. And smaller scale observations as well. Although this was done over a longer period of time, think about the Jackson burnouts, Penny Eckert Jackson burnout study, where there was quantification of how often people were using negative concords. So she observed these people in the in their environment, to her credit, and saw how many opportunities they had to say double negatives, negative concord, and how many of them they actually realized this negative concord usage. It's again a quantification of a linguistic property. And such quantifications can lead, not necessarily, but can favor edict interpretations. And that's not a bad thing, that's not a slight, it's just a difference. There's a we talked about this when we were talking about different methodologies and leading into our ethics conversation. There's nothing wrong with edict versus emic studies. They both can have value. We just need to know which one we want and which one's better suited for the kind of information we're after. And these quantifications can favor edict interpretations because there's an underlying this is complicated and I, um, I'll be totally transparent. I hadn't actually planned on talking about this in as much depth as I am, but I'll make, take a stab at it anyway, is that there's an underlying ideology which pervades edict interpretations, that the numbers show you what's what. That reliance, that ideological reliance on numbers, which is the backbone of science, which I am not striking down or speaking out against it all, but we have to realize that ideology um, that the numbers tell us things. And the numbers often, the way we use them, get are easily biased by researcher interpretations. They don't have to be. We can use quantitative studies to, um, to test and probe at emic interpretations, but it's just a little bit more difficult. That takes a lot more work. Right? That takes the marriage of emic and edict methodologies in some way, or at least emic interpretations with a lot of quantitative style studies. For whatever reason, that doesn't happen quite as often. Not never, but rarely. Whoa, we got side railed there a little bit. Let's 
keep going here. <laughs> These things that I'm going over relatively quickly or less quickly in the case of these past couple are nice sites for you to ask me questions on Monday about them if they're not making sense. Can you talk more about this difference between the methodologies of these different um, disciplines? And I'm happy to do that and I can answer any questions you like then. Cool. This I would say is one of the bigger differences. Those are my two, so my two kind of like bullet pointed differences are their different focus and their different methodologies. Ranging out from that, there are some other kind of stereotypes, some other tendencies or observations, feelings that people have about these two different disciplines, associations or indexical values that people have with these two different disciplines. And here's one of them. So. This one I'm grounding less in sort of like tradition or reality and just telling you some perceptions. A common perception is that anthropologists, including linguistic anthropologists, tend to work with more rural populations and native or exotic communities. And I put exotic communities in quotes there so you know that I'm not um, a huge fan of that word and the way it gets used, but again, I'm telling you about other people's perceptions. So cue uh, Joe Exotic over here to lay in the mood. And that sociolinguistics, sociolinguists tend to work with more westernized communities in more urban areas. That's the perception. It's not, these don't line up. You can do a linguistic anthropological study dealing with ideologies and more in New York City, if you like. Um, and you can do a sociolinguistic study in Papua New Guinea. Both of these things have happened. Those are studies that exist. So these are not categorical, but there is an association between these things. I want to talk quickly now about the history behind these, kind of how did these disciplines differ and how did we get here? And I mentioned this at the beginning of, we did a, I did a quick historical rundown of how sociolinguistics got to be where it is. I did that like pretty early on in the semester, so that was quite a while ago. You can go back and watch that one if you want, I suppose. It's probably week one or two. And what happened here is that linguistics in general in the United States, not sociolinguistics, but linguistics overall in the United States, the tradition is born out of, is a descendant of linguistic anthropology. So this guy, this crazy guy in the bottom <laughs> is Franz Boas. And he is a Lingu he's a linguistic anthropologist in the United States, and he is credited kind of as the father of what eventually became linguistics. He had two um, really important students. You guys have probably heard of these guys before. You probably heard of these guys if you watched the last lecture. That's Benjamin Lee Worf over here on the top left and Edward Sapir on the right. They don't have anywhere near as of crazy as pictures. Oh, you can't see him being quite as crazy. Let me see. When I googled Franz Boas, he's in all these like strange poses and like half naked in some of them and these guys are just looking way too straight laced. Maybe that's the difference between anthropology and sociolinguistics is anthropologists take crazy pictures. I don't know. You heard it here first. Um, and so the whole field of linguistics is born out of linguistic anthropology in the United States. That's not necessarily true of European traditions of linguistics, which are born more out of historical linguistics and philology, as it was called then. But here in the United States, a lot of our tradition owes its origins to these linguistic anthropologists. And so it's um, That kind of brings us to this quote by uh, Buchholz and Hall in 2008, and they're pointing to this history and they're saying that like, as the history of sociolinguistics and linguistic anthropology shows, a sharp distinction between these fields and others connected with the sociocultural investigation of language is untenable, given their significant common ground. It's downplaying the differences here and saying like, they came from the same place, they study a lot of the same things, they have so much overlap, there's not as much distinction 
to say this is one field and this is the other. There's a merging and a melding between these two. I still think it's valuable to talk about these differences and to pitch these differences to you in these terms so you can see sort of the difference in focus and difference in methodology. And so you can, oh, I'll talk about this in a second, but one of the reasons this has value is that you can understand the historical trajectories and traditions involved with these disciplines such that when you read a study about language and culture and socio aspects, social aspects, you can see, ah, this is a sociolinguistic study that is borrowing heavily from linguistic anthropology. Or if it's a large order survey, you can say, ah, this is a kind of classic sociolinguistics. You can understand what you're getting into as you read various studies. Which is what I want to talk about right now. Oh, I snuck it in before myself here. And so, I'll um, make myself a little smaller so you can actually read this text. Whoa, I'll make myself bigger later. Like I was saying, with armed with this knowledge of some of the differences between these subdisciplines, we can chart in a lot of ways the trajectory of the field. So if we look at, for instance, we read that article by Penny Eckert at the beginning of the semester about the three waves of sociolinguistics. We can see a trend. We can see a steady progression here. So think about keeping in mind the differences between sociolinguistics and linguistic anthropology. Let's revisit quickly some of the things we know about the waves of sociolinguistics. In the first wave, there were huge groups, which huge groups necessitates quantitative surveys and studies, right? You can't do nitty gritty detailed qualitative, qual, <laughs> qualitative, whoo, qualitative studies on huge swaths of the population. You have to use surveys and you have to rely on quanti quantification. And also you kind of have to be focused. So you do studies that ask only about linguistic variables. So there's an emphasis in the first wave on surveys, big populations, and strict linguistic variables out of context. Does that sound like anything that we may have just talked about? Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. It sounds like classic conceptions of sociolinguistic methodology, quantitative, linguistically focused, and possibly edict, using surveys, and etc. Okay, let's keep going. In the second wave, and even more so in the third wave, the communities, the populations being targeted by these studies get smaller and smaller. And as the populations get smaller, it allows for qualitative observations. Now we don't have to just rely on surveys anymore. We can actually meet the people face to face and think about what they're doing with their language. In addition, because we're doing these observations, we can note the linguistic variables in context, in social context, which means we get the full picture. We get to see everything, the other cultural, cultural elements. We get to see their facial expressions. We get to see the way that they're dressing. We get to see how close they stand to other people. We get to see more of these cultural systems at play with linguistics in it when you do an observation as opposed to a survey. And we get to focus not just on language, but more on things like identity. That's a classic third wave and second wave study. Does that sound like anything that you may have heard in today's lecture? I know I'm annoying when I do things like that. Yeah, it does, right? That sounds more like linguistic anthropology, to be frank, right? More ethnography, more qualitative, more emic interpretations of what people think they're doing and how that contributes to a system of meaning through which identity is derived. Bam! Linguistic anthropology shining through. So what... I'm going to argue we see here is sociolinguistics and linguistic anthropology with sociolinguistics moving with a merging of these two fields, with sociolinguistics moving closer to linguistic anthropology. 
with a caveat that like doesn't matter do we care like should we be keeping these things distinct no we're all talking about the same sorts of ideas and if anything this cross-pollination of this merger in which sociolinguistics gets more observation and qualitative pictures of the big picture, the holistic nature, is only a benefit to sociolinguistics. And as a side note, linguistic anthropology cross-pollinating with, soci with the linguistics world and getting from it a quantitative backbone of science, regardless of um, whether that's always useful or not, is certainly a benefit to the field as well, especially as we move more and more into quantitative measurements, leveraging the power of computers and technology. Like I tied all that nicely with our corpus stuff as well. So I'm going to argue that they're merging together and that that's strictly a good thing. It doesn't make sense for these two disciplines to stay distinct. We're talking about the same thing. The goals are largely overlapping and so this sharing of methodologies and knowledge and ideas is beneficial and that's i mean penny eckert who you've i've been talking a lot i've said her name like five times already this lecture is is absolutely aware of this i'm not the one like you know saying this is happening or coming up with this stuff there's an awareness within sociolinguistics that this sort of merger and movement is happening and that that's a good thing and that that's a good thing. You can see that um, also looking back on these methodologies, if you take uh, into account our talks about communities of practice versus speech communities, a lot of the Penny Eckert's points about the benefits of community of practice over speech communities are things like taking lingu language as one of a number of social systems and not putting language on a pedestal. That's a rejection of the stereotypically classic notion of linguistics and sociolinguistics and an embracing of linguistic anthropology. And in large part, Penny Eckert is the current face of sociolinguistics. I don't know if she would like me saying that or not, but so that's coming from not a marginal person within this field, but a central figure saying, hey, we need to look at the big picture like linguistic anthropology already does. And again, it's not a prioritization. There's not. I, I don't attend. I don't intend this highlighting of the differences to be a glamorization of linguistic anthropology. Again, there's cross pollination and benefits being had on both sides of this. There's a lot that sociolinguistics and linguistics has to offer as well. Um, when we work together, there's a unity. Um, cheese, cheesy phrase to be had here. I think. All right. Where was I? Okay. How am I doing? I'm at about 33 minutes. I'm going to talk quickly about fieldwork. And I'm going to, so we're going to talk a little bit about fieldwork today. And if I don't get to all of it, I'll talk about it more later. So let me switch over screens real quick. Oh, I'm going to put take that down and put this up. It's not what I wanted. That's, excuse me, that's what I wanted. This is going to seem like a weird segue, but I'll bring it back around in a second, I promise. I'll connect these things. But I'm going to talk a little bit about linguistic diversity in the world, and it's going to tie into fieldwork and kind of why fieldwork is important. So I'm going to give you a quick background here in languages of the world. So this is an estimate taken from Ethnologue, but there's about 7,000, 6 to 8,000 ish languages, living languages spoken natively by people in the world right now. Which is pretty cool. It's a, it's a lot of languages. Yeah, it's not a small number. So good luck learning them. What are you guys at? Probably one, two, three, maybe four languages. You're only 7,093 languages off. Um, and some interesting stats about this is that more than half the world's population speaks just 23 of these languages. So there's 7,000, we're just going to say 7,000 as a ballpark, but know that that's an estimate. Out of these 7,000 languages, Half the world's population speaks 23 of these languages. That leaves the other half of the population to speak the 7,074. Um, Ooh, math, quick math. 7,074 languages. And the 86% of people speak 
Asian or European languages. So these are not evenly distributed as well. You can see, oops, whoops, whoops, throwing button. You can see again this discrepancy in distribution in this graph right here where over two thirds of these 7,000 languages are from Africa and Asia where only 4% of the world's languages are from Europe, right? Like, my mind is a little blown by that, especially with how uh, Anglo and Eurocentric our studies tend to be. If you ask somebody to randomly name languages, they're going to say English and French and German and stuff like that. But that's only 4% of the world's languages in Europe. I mean, Asia is obviously much, 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 much bigger than Europe is. But even, I'm sure of this, taking in size comparisons, that doesn't match up. It doesn't match up. I take that back. I have no idea how that matches up. I am bad at geography. How about that? But it's still surprising, given our, um, you know, again, Eurocentrism. Somebody do the math. Does that actually check out? If we did like a languages per square mile, I'm super curious now, but I have no idea. Anyway, more distributional discrepancies. We find that Pacific and American languages on average have 1000 speakers each, but yet together represent more than a third of the world's populations. So these languages, there's a lot of languages with a very low number of speakers. This is average, so that can be a little deceiving, but it is nonetheless true. Here's, here's the less average version of that previous stat, that roughly a third of all languages are considered endangered. And there's many definitions for what it means to be an endangered language. We can talk about that on Monday. If somebody asks me about it, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, here, we're going to use the definition of less than a thousand speakers as kind of a nice ballpark for what it means for a language to be endangered. A third of all languages have less than a thousand speakers. Can you imagine how small that is? A thousand speakers, and these are less, often way less, often 150 speakers. How, do, how does this happen? We could probably spend tons and tons of time talking about this. Maybe we will talk about this more on Monday. How does this happen? This happens in a couple of ways. So one of the ways that I always hear about in like alarmist media and things like this is that it's languages become endangered through population endangerment. Languages that become endangered due to things like genocide, disease, famine, war, catastrophe, volcanoes exploding, etc. Through population loss. Languages lost through population loss. Does that ever happen? Probably yes. Probably yes. But far in a way, that's not how most of these languages gone to this point. Far and away, the most common pr uh, producer of endangered language is something called language shift. Language shift. And language shift is when speakers give up their ancestral or native languages to learn another language. They shift languages from one to another. And typically, um, the motivations for this have to do with um, prestige, oppression, uh, economic dominance, so you that's a huge one, is that you learn a language to improve, you shift to another language like English, like French, like Chinese, for economic opportunities, which is straightforward and reasonable. This isn't, this isn't uh, a fault, right? This isn't Oh, somebody messed up so that these languages are going endangered. No, not, not necessarily the case, right? These people are just looking out for themselves and for their families and their own economic or social opportunities and often shifting away. We'll come back to that probably later. And language loss occurs when there are no speakers left. That's the, um, that's the end point in some ways of language endangerment. Hopefully not the end point, but it can be an end point for language. Um, for language endangerment. Cool, cool. So, 
So, as in this world, that sets the context for what I wanted to talk about next, which is linguistic fieldwork and language documentation. Linguists' response to this situation, where roughly a third of all languages have less than a thousand speakers, is to document these languages as fast as we possibly can while fluent native speakers still exist to get an accurate representation of the language. Yet, there are projections that between 50 to 90 percent of all languages in the world in the world are expected to go extinct by 2100 by 2100 out of those 7000 languages 50 to 90 percent are expected to die out become extinct by 2100 2100 is 80 years from now it's feasible that that's within your lifetime quick math check here, that's a rate of a language becoming extinct about every two weeks. How long has this course been? What week are we on now? That's a, that's an alarming, that's an alarming and slightly alarmist perspective on language loss. But it's an important one to understand languages in the world and language in the world because it's a reality is this a guarantee is it the case that 90 percent of all languages will be lost by 2100 no that's a projection that's a prediction and it's a prediction that people have made in seeing that languages are going extinct rather rapidly that's the reality so we don't have to be terribly alarmist about this but languages are shrinking um, in population often with the most popular languages becoming even more popular like English and Chinese and the least populations becoming less popular leading to a lot of language death language loss cool. and so the result like I said is linguistic dom uh, documentation and linguistic documentation is done by lots of different linguists, not just sociolinguistics, not just linguistic anthropologists, but by a lot of different language trained folks engaging in linguistic fieldwork or fieldwork in general. And this fieldwork here, uh, here's a couple of quotes by Claire Bauer, and I won't read all of them, but it's about collecting data in its natural in environment. It's studying a language in place where it's actually spoken by the people who actually speak it. It's going to the place and working with actual people, that's linguistic fieldwork, again, which is a heavily, more heavily emphasized methodology within linguistic anthropology. That's the connector between these two kind of halves of today's lecture. We already talked about collecting data in an ethical manner. We already talked about this kind of linguist and community agreement. It's the ideal state for fieldwork rather than sort of the historical trajectory of these types of field work where a field worker would go into a community get all the data they need and say peace and then go make a bank on it while the community sits in its uh, possibly but not guaranteed whatever state they left them in at best without the linguist helping out whether that's poverty or riches again there's things that linguists can be contributing so now I want, that's what that's what linguistic field work is and so people are creating going in doing field work and doing linguistic documentation that involves documenting writing down various aspects of the language a, a basic form of this is um, making a dictionary so dictionary making is a baseline kind of critical activity of people doing language documentation. This word means this, a translation dictionary, right? But it goes beyond that too, because we don't, languages as we know, hopefully we know, oh my goodness, hopefully we know at this point in the semester that languages are more than just a dictionary. Yeah, it's not just words. So also what language documentation captures is called the grammar, a grammar for the language, how the sentence structure is, what the morphology is like, what the phonology is like, what the 
everything is, with the syntax is like, with the semantics and pragmatics and all these other subdisciplines, they're trying to capture as best they can in a relatively short period of time. One of the reasons we do this is because languages, there's a lot of languages that have been poorly studied and most language systems in the world don't have writing systems. They're not written down anywhere. So only about 2,000 language systems have writing. We have written documentation of. And so that leaves about 5,000 languages that have no written form. No written form. So these, when they stop being spoken by the populations which speak them, they're gone. Irrevocably gone in many cases. And that's what this is trying to prevent. That's what this is trying to prevent. Cool. Um, two other quick notes. I know I'm, I'm rushing through this, but again, I'm giving us a baseline of things, hopefully, that we can talk about on Monday. There's more to be talked about here with language, language documentation. A couple quick notes is where does this happen? Where does this happen? And the answer is anywhere, right? This plays upon that rural versus urban, exotic versus domestic um, dimension that we were looking at earlier and the truth is that there's language documentation that can be done anywhere there's field work that can be done anywhere whether it's in here's an example india's remote pradesh state or whether it's the field work that i was telling you i uh, did conducted a very short version of in northern indiana it can be done anywhere Whew. last thing the last thing i want to leave you with is um, a question and the question is, so what? Is this important work? Why do we care? Why do we care to do language documentation? I have find some video, um, some reasons, but not very particularly compelling ones. Not the best. I didn't. I didn't tell you the juiciest reasons we do language documentation and field work. But the question, or the question I want to pose to you is, why should we? as humans care about language loss, right? So in essence, a summary of this fieldwork session or a section of the lecture would be, we do language documentation to prevent language loss. Most, I think, maybe not all, but I think most linguists and field workers would agree with that general sentiment. There are other reasons. There are many, many, many other reasons, but one of them is to prevent language loss. And so the question I ask you and where I want to pick up on Monday is, why do we care about language loss? And it's easy to have here a knee-jerk reaction, like, ah, because languages are cool. I'm a, I'm a language nerd. Hopefully I've converted you uh, by this point. I'm a linguist. Of course I care about languages. But I want you to stop and slow down avoid that knee-jerk reaction of like, yeah, why wouldn't we care? And to actually try and think through why we should, what's the value? What, what is the value of languages such that that value is lost when a language is lost? As a spoiler alert, I care about language loss and I think you should too. So what I'm not saying is we don't care at all. What I'm saying is why? Let's be specific and let's try and pinpoint why we care about that. And we'll pick that up. I'm going to open with that question, if I remember this. I'll open with that question on Monday in our synchronous, not in person, virtual, but nonetheless live synchronous chat on Monday. Cool, 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 cool. Look at that, I almost nailed, I got 50 seconds left before I hit my 50 minute mark according to my clock. So um, thanks for watching this lecture. These will get hopefully a little smoother and better as I become more comfortable with my recording, but there's hopefully some good meat for you to work through. Feel free to watch parts of this um, over again. And like I said, take advantage of the technology, pause me. Uh, I'm not offended when you pause me. If you mute me, I might be a little bit offended, but I'm certainly not offended if you pause me and come back later. So take advantage of this technology, and we'll talk about a lot of these topics, both linguistic relativity and linguistic anthropology on Monday. And read um, that article, the chapter actually, by Keith Basso.
Um, and I'll see you guys all on Monday, hopefully. Or at least I'll see some of you. Three, two, one.